Ooh. <laughs> it's grainy day in the dark. <laughs> Ooh, I was about to wait too late tonight. I'm sorry. It has been a day. And if you didn't look at my other videos, now I know I said last night I was going live at noon today. I tried. I tried. For about an hour I tried. And I knew y'all were, some of y'all were sitting at the door waiting to come in. And it just, did, I screwed up the phone. So now I can't even go online on the phone. <laughs> going to T-Mobile tomorrow. See if they can undo what I did. I was trying to fix it so y'all would get notifications because it said you could do that. I should, I ought to know not to fool with nothing. And I'm still working on the computer too, but I thought of a fella who can help me out. I'm pretty sure he can. And he lives right here in Faith. Here are buddies, nutty buddies. Liliana gave me Rocky from... Karen, KB Fibers, and look at this, y'all. Oh, of course, my squirrel lights from Sue, and this from, oh my goodness, Flat Sam's tail come undone. <laughs> that was from Kathy, from Jane. I always like to give credit to me. Look what that Sue sent me. Now, if that ain't the truth, and I know some of y'all saw my unboxing today, but it's going to go, I don't know, what do y'all think? Up here, it needs to be where y'all can see it. No, nah, if I put it on the side there, over here, maybe up and over, down. <laughs> I'm trying to look at the screen and knock everything down. Well, it'll go up soon. I think I was hunting for nails today. I got a hammer, but uh, <sighs> it went out like my technology issues. Um, but I think it would be better if I used those 3M strips. So I'll have to get some of those too. And yes, payday happened, folks. So happy mail is going to be happening soon. And I know I told y'all I should have been making stitch markers all along. Well, I had some, but I gave them to some other folks. So, I got to make more. Okay, Tom Sawyer, Chapter 6. And we got a fly flying around in here. And I've actually taken a bath. <laughs> Let him in from going in and out. Okay, this is called uh, self-examination, dentistry, the midnight charm, witches and devils, cautious approaches, and happy hours. Monday morning found Tom Sawyer miserable. Am I at the right place? Yeah, I reckon I will. Yeah, cause yeah, cause the last thing that happened was the church and the beetle and all that stuff. Okay, Monday morning found Tom Sawyer miserable. Monday mornings always found him so because it began another week's slow suffering wear in school. He generally began that day with wishing he had no intervening holiday. It made the going into captivity and in fetters again so much odious. Tom lay thinking. Presently, it occurred to him that he wished he was sick. Then he could stay home from school. Now, here was a vague possibility. He canvassed his system. No ailment was found, he in, and he investigated again. This time, he thought he could detect colicky symptoms, and he began to encourage them with considerable hope, but they soon grew feeble and presently died wholly away. He reflected further. Suddenly, he discovered something. One of his upper front teeth was loose. This was lucky. He was about to begin to groan as a starter. <laughs> you know, I used to like, try to get out of school all the time. Oh, man. In first grade, we didn't have to go to kindergarten back in the day. So, first grade, man, I thought I had to come up with a new illness every day. Mama wasn't too happy. And it was funny that I then had a career as a teacher. And, you know, I still hated to go to school every day. 
No, I didn't. <laughs> Sit down. Uh, occurred to him that if he came into court with that argument, let's see, when he was about to groan as a starter, as he called it, when it occurred to him that if he came into court with that argument, his aunt would pull it out, and that would hurt. So he thought he would hold the tooth in reserve for the present and seek further. Nothing offered for some time, some little time, and then he remembered hearing the doctor tell about a certain thing that laid up a patient for two or three weeks and threatened to make him lose a finger. So the boy eagerly drew his sore toe up from under the sheet and held it up for inspection, but now he did not know the necessary symptoms. However, it seemed well worthwhile to chance it, so he fell to groaning with considerable spirit. But Sid slept on unconscious. Tom groaned louder and fancy that he began to feel pain in the toe. No result from Sid. Tom was panting with his exertions by this time. He took a rest and then swelled himself up and fetched a succession of admirable groans. Sid snored on. Tom was aggravated. He said, Sid. Sid, and shook him. This course worked well, and Tom began to groan again. Sid yawned, stretched, and then brought himself up on his elbow with a snort and began to stare at Tom. Tom went on groaning, and Sid said, Tom, say, Tom, no response. Here, Tom, Tom, what's the matter, Tom? And he shook him and looked in his face anxiously, and Tom moaned out, Oh, don't, Sid, don't joggle me. Well, what's the matter, Tom? I must call Annie. No, never mind. It'll be over run by, maybe. Don't call nobody. But I must. Don't groan so, Tom. It's awful. How long you been this way? Hours. Ow! Don't stir so, Sid. You'll kill me. Tom, why didn't you wake me sooner? Oh, Tom, don't. It makes my flesh crawl to hear you. Tom, what is the matter? I forgive you everything, Sid. Oh, everything you've ever done to me. When I'm gone. Oh, Tom, you ain't dying, are you? Don't, Tom. Oh, don't. Maybe I forgive everybody, Sid. Oh, tell them so, Sid. And, and Sid... You give my window sash and, and my cat with one eye to that, that new girl that's come to town and tell her. But Sid had snatched his clothes and gone. Tom was suffering in reality now. So handsomely was his imagination working, and so his groans had gathered quite a genuine tone. Sid flew downstairs and said, Oh, Aunt Polly, come. Tom's a dying. Dying? Yes, um, don't wait. Come quick. Rubbish. I don't believe it. Rubbage, excuse me. I thought that sounded too British for Aunt Polly. But she fled upstairs, nevertheless, with Sid and Mary at her heels, and her face grew white, too, and her lip trembled. When she reached the bedside, she gasped out, You, Tom, Tom, what's the matter with you? Oh, Annie, I'm... What's the matter with you? What What is with you, child? Oh, Annie, my sore toe is, is mortified. The old lady sank down into her chair and laughed a little and then cried a little, then did both together. This restored her, and she said, Tom, what a turn you did give me. Now you shut up that nonsense and climb out of this. The groan ceased. And the pain vanished from the toe. The boy felt a little foolish. And he said, Aunt Polly, it seemed mortified and it hurt so. I never minded my tooth at all. Remember, <laughs> he kept that in reserve. <laughs> your tooth indeed. What's the matter with your tooth? Well, one of them's loose and it aches perfectly awful. There, there. Now, don't begin that groaning again. Open your mouth. Well, your tooth is loose, but you're not going to die about it. Mary, get me a silk thread and a chunk of fire out of the kitchen. And Tom said, oh, please, Annie, don't pull it out. It don't hurt anymore. 
I wish I may never stir if it does. Please don't, Annie. I don't want to stay home from school. Oh, you don't, don't you? So all this row was because you thought you'd get to stay home from school and go a fishing? Tom, Tom, I love you so, and you seem to try every way you can to break my old heart with your outrageousness. By this time, the dental instruments were ready. <laughs> The old lady made one end of the silk thread fast to Tom's tooth with the loop and tied the other to the bedpost. Then she seized the chunk of fire and suddenly thrust it almost into the boy's face. The tooth hung, dangling by the bedpost now. But all trials bring their compensations. As Tom wended to school after breakfast, he was the envy of every boy he met because the gap in his upper row of teeth enabled him to expectorate, what that means, spit, in a new and admirable way. He gathered quite a following of lads interested in the exhibition and one that had cut his finger and had been the center of fascination and homage up to this time, now found himself suddenly without and adherent and shorn of his glory. His heart was heavy, and he said with a disdain which he did not feel that he wasn't any that it wasn't anything to spit like Tom Sawyer, but another boy said sour grapes, and he wandered away, a dismantled hero. Shortly Tom came upon the juvenile pariah of the village, Huckleberry Finn, son of the town drunkard. Huckleberry was cordially hated and dreaded by all the mothers of the town because he was idle and lawless and vulgar and bad and because all their children admired him so <laughs> and delighted in his forbidden society and wished they dared to be like him. Tom was like the, res other respect the rest of the respectable boys in that he envied Huckleberry his gaudy outcast condition and was under strict orders not to play with him. So he played with him every time he got a chance. Huckleberry was always dressed in his cast-off clothes, a full in the cast-off clothes of full-grown men. Oh no, I got it. Miss about messed up my squirrel scarf. I forgot to mention that from Lisa. I got a little thing on my fingernail. That tore. Sorry about that. Uh, the cast-off clothes of full-grown men, and they were in perennial bloom and fluttering with rags. His hat was a vast ruin with a wide crescent locked out of its brim. His coat, when he wore one, hung neatly to his heels <laughs> and had the rearward buttons far down the back, but one suspender supported his trousers. The seat of the trousers bagged low and contained nothing. The fringed legs dragged in the dirt when not rolled up. Huckleberry came and went at his own free will. He slept on doorsteps in fine weather and in empty hog sheds in winter in in wet. He did not have to go to school or to church or call any being master or obey anybody. He could go fishing or swimming when and where he chose and stay as long as it suited him. Nobody forbade him to fight. He could sit up as late as he pleased. He was always the first boy that went barefoot in the spring. Sorry, I'm looking at the time, yeah. And the last to resume leather in the fall. He never had to wash nor put on clean clothes. He could swear wonderfully. In a word, everything that goes to make life precious, that boy had. So thought every harassed, hampered, respectable boy in St. Petersburg. Tom held the romantic outcast. Hello, Huckleberry. Hello yourself and see how you like it. What's that you got, dead cat? Let me see him, Huck. My, he's pretty stiff. Where'd you get him? Bought him off of a boy. What'd you give? I give a blue ticket and a bladder I got at the slaughterhouse. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Where'd you get the blue ticket? Bought it off in Ben Rogers two weeks ago for a hoop stick. Say, what's a dead cat? What is dead cats good for, Huck? And I'll stop there because I'm right, almost at 15 minutes. I will try to finish the rest 
in the next video. I just want to go ahead and upload this because I don't want to mess it up again. See you in a little.